Thank you, Chad. I was asked to talk about uh, soil testing methods, and, and uh, I want to thank uh, Jill, too, for really setting a great uh, oh, stage and perspective from the standpoint of soil health. And, and um, this is the star of the show, folks. It's, it's uh, the soil right here. And uh, from that standpoint, uh, you know, the fate of the planet rests on how we manage this thin, dark line. And, uh, you know, Wendell Berry said, what we do to the land, we do to ourselves. And certainly, you know, the legacy of our civilization rests and, is, and can be actually assessed by looking at what our soils look like and assessing those. So, you know, I, I think I manufactured this slide last night after the, after the beer and bull session. Maybe I was getting a little bit too, too uh, philosophical. But anyway, you know, soil health uh, is, is far beyond the understanding of scientific papers or beyond the, the testimonials of, of farmers or consultants or, or poets. And certainly, it's as essential as the air we breathe and as important as the words of children. Somebody probably said that before me, but you know, assessing soil health, and Jill said this, you know, from the standpoint of the Gaia theory, et cetera, is it's an integrative process and engages, you know, in all that one can sense, measure, or understand. And certainly we're seeking to capture the history of the life and death that occurs in the soil. The memory of all those activities is there if you can if you can read the script, and they're preserved in the morphology, the properties the processes, the adaptive features. And certainly, in assessing soil, um, what I tend to look for is to look for those more holistic measures that do integrate quite a few uh, properties from the standpoint of the biology, the chemistry, the physics that are ongoing. So I want to talk a little bit about the, the ideal soil test, and not that this exists, uh, but it's perhaps some of the criteria, the criteria, at least some of my criteria, from the standpoint of how I look at any test that uh, is trying to assess uh, what's going on in soil. And first of all, you know, as a scientist, evidence-based is important. It's derived from the application of scientific principles and, and methods. It has to be sensitive to changes in management and applicable to many different conditions. It'd be nice if it was rapid to perform and requiring little labor. Uh, it'd be nice if it was low cost. It'd be great if it was accurate and easily uh, standardized. I'd like to see it performed ideally in the field to capture real world conditions. And you know, and probably most importantly, you know, the test needs to be valued because it's going to be directly used to make better decisions. And, you know, if you look at the soil health concept, and I've gone around the circle in the block a few times, and it's kind of been plagued by shortcomings in meeting some of these kinds of ideal uh, tests that we're talking about. So I'm going to go through a little bit of my favorites, and it's certainly not all of them, but it perhaps probably will at least get you thinking about uh, things perhaps in a little bit different way, maybe not. Um, the crop, soil, integrative kinds of, of tests. These are important, and they directly reflect the efficiencies that are going on with respect to nutrient water use. Uh, this, is a, this is a map from the Cook Agronomy Farm that uh, Dr. Moyer was talking about earlier, part of the, the LTAR now. And, you know, if we had a yield monitor and a protein sensor linked together, we could uh, quantify the export of nitrogen in the grain. Uh, many of you may have variable rate applicators where we can geospatially show where nitrogen was applied from the standpoint of fertilizer. A simple ratio, a balance index, if you will, of, of nitrogen exported versus nitrogen inputs gives you a real sense of how nitrogen is being taken up from our soil. And if we look at uptake efficiencies which are a, a component of some of our overall nitrogen use efficiency, you know, that, at least at the Cook Farm, is an area where we're really seeing a lot of spatial variability. And if we could start to come up with measures of that, then if we can measure it, we can start to manage it more effectively. And uh, you can see from this slide, this is nitrogen in the grain divided by nitrogen fertilizer applied. It's ranging from 0.1, 10%, up over, I think, if I could read that, 0 0.7, 0 0.8. Uh, there's areas in this field with 
tremendous soil and tremendous quality of that soil that really is promoting efficient use of water and nutrients. And it's very different from other soil that is in this same landscape. Organic matter, of course, everyone talks about, and there's different fractions of organic matter that are, have different functions. And I won't get into this too much, but suffice to say that um, it's the more active fractions, the more labile constituents that we really can have an impact on from the standpoint of, of management. Of course, erosion throws in another whole dimension from the standpoint of impacting some of the physical uh, properties as, as well as transport of more recalcitrant fractions. But still, you know, coming up with better tests of soil organic matter uh, are, are something that we've been working on and others have worked on. One that we've really seen as something that's related directly to, to uh, overall soil carbon, which is, a, is, a, is, a, is a basically a, a function of soil organic matter, uh, is this permanganate oxidizable carbon. And we've seen direct relationships for long-term studies across the Pacific Northwest. And I think it's a pretty neat test. It's fairly inexpensive. You could do it in the field. You could set up a laboratory to do it. And there's other tests that we've examined in terms of the Salvita test that you may have heard about, as well as the, one of the Haiti tests. And there's actually a poster outside that looks at those tests from the standpoint of their sensitivity to look at and assess differences in, in management. I encourage you to go look at that poster. Uh, this is soil nitrogen from just the combustible nitrogen and carbon from a soil test, again, in the top foot. And many of you may or may not be surprised that when we look at the organic nitrogen and inorganic nitrogen across our landscapes, we find in this case it, it was ranging from, and I can't see these slides very well, around 20, 2,600 2, pounds per acre of nitrogen in the lowest locations in the top foot, up past almost 6,800 pounds of nitrogen in the top foot. This was back in 1999 at the Cook Farm. And then in 2008, when we sampled 10 years later, we found a lot more uh, soil test nitrogen in the top foot. This is total nitrogen again. And, you know, gains basically of over 300 pounds or during that 10-year period, or about 10 pounds per year, that reflect some of the increases in soil organic matter that occurred since we converted to a direct seed system. Eddie Covariance flux towers are pretty neat as well to look at gas fluxes, and we had those set up at the Cook Farm now as well as some of these static chambers. And uh, from that standpoint, looking at gas fluxes like carbon dioxide, like nitrous oxide, and having those in place and monitoring year round give you a direct measure of what the changes could be from the net differences in soil over time in terms of the soil organic matter. If we have a, a positive flux into the soil, we can measure that from this particular type of methodology. And we could see what the impact different practices have from the standpoint of our, our tillage, our crop rotations, et cetera, what impact they're having specifically on this exchange of gases. And monitoring those is kind of fun from the standpoint of a, of a scientist. And those little chambers that you see there are automa automatic chambers that open and close on an hourly basis and assess then gases that are coming from the soil and produce some pretty interesting data from the standpoint of seeing how those soils are responding, the biological activity, et cetera, are responding to different kinds of perturbations that we have. And the earthworms have been mentioned. This is, a, again, from five feet going down at the Cook Farm. And, you know, infiltration, pore size distribution, we talk about structure. You know, it's about the porosity. Uh, the porosity defines the environment that many organisms live within. And we also have, of course, organisms like earthworms, roots, et cetera, that help to, to be architects of that uh, soil uh, pore size distribution. And infiltration is a, a neat measure, whether you're using a, a $2,000 uh, tension infiltrometer or a, a coffee can, or just looking and observing at how rain infiltrates or runs off your soil. Infiltration, the pore size distribution, the connectedness of those pores is extremely important and something that we can manage from the standpoint of our, of our cropping systems. So pH, sometimes called the master variable, really again reflects a lot of different kinds of, of uh, processes that have occurred in the soil itself. Um, 
Of course, um, uh, one that we've been struggling here with in the Pacific Northwest and our dryland systems with respect to acidification uh, problems. And, and, you know, here's just a relationship between soil pH and, and what used to be the base saturation. Uh, this is reflectant of what's on the cannon exchange capacity of those soils. And really, as we start to, to get below 50% base saturation, we start to run into issues of of perhaps aluminum toxicity and other kinds of things. So again, a direct test and an indicator of what might be occurring and some danger thresholds that we might be approaching. And you know, determining the lime requirement comes back to some pH uh, measurements, initial pH, final pH, and relationships with uh, uh, calcium carbonate additions. Again, directly back, related back to the decision-making process. Another favorite one of mine, particularly from a research perspective, is looking at what I call sometimes the nutrient supplying power of soil. These are cation and anion exchangers that you can put in the soil itself, either in the field or in the laboratory. They act as sinks for macro and micronutrients, both cations and anions. And again, they can use, these kinds of measurements can be used to directly relate to soil fertilizer uh, recommendations and prescriptions. So again, a direct link to decision making. And you can combine some of those types of measures, the box C and the PRS probes in this case, to actually look at some of the more um, impacts of active fractions of organic matter. In this case, we have box C, which is more of a, of a, of a uh, intermediate kinds of, of, of carbon. And you can see that for a given level of epoxy, we can have different supplies of nutrients coming from that, again, reflecting differences that management is impacting from the standpoint of, of a nutrient supplying power. And lastly, I just want to say that, uh, you know, in, in Laytock County at the Conservation District, um, the board is actively pursuing some of the soil health issues. Uh, Tabitha Brown is, is heading up a project now uh, funded through the NRCS CIG uh, process. And, you know, I call it testing the testers. And uh, basically, we need to come up with better ways to quantify um, what different kinds of management practices are how, and how they're impacting our soil, our soil health, and our, our cropping systems. Oops. Thanks. <laughs> All right, and we'll have Bill, and I forgot to mention, this session is sponsored by Monsanto. Thank you. Oh, we're getting set up. I was just wondering how many of you in the audience take routine soil tests, and you're probably thinking, I need to go back and look at that soil test report, because I don't see any of this information on my soil test report. And I. I started thinking about the whole history of soil testing, and you know, I teach that in my class on soil fertility, and it goes back, you know, 50, 60 years, World War II era, and people were developing these chemical tests to assess nutrient availability by figuring out different ways to extract it and simulate plant roots, and uh, and all the focus was on that that then plow layer, right? And and so you'd get a whole test of organic matter, pH, EC, uh, available nutrients, so on and so forth, right in that plow layer. And uh, almost uh, exclusively ignoring the, the subsoil. So it's been great discussions talking about that full root zone. And it's so critical. And all of that really came out of the Midwest, and we all kind of mimic that. And you think about, OK, that's humid, subhumid region where, well, that makes sense to focus on that top layer because that's completely being replenished throughout the growing season. You get summer rainfalls and active rooting throughout the season in that, that surface soil. But that's not what we've got in, in, in our soils here in the Pacific Northwest. We're semi-arid. We store the water in the wintertime. We drain it out from the top down. And uh, the roots, the rooting activity behaves accordingly. So it starts out in that top layer, that dries out, and then the rooting activity goes foot by foot down deeper and deeper looking for the water. And so why hasn't our um, soil testing reflected that? Well, we, we've at least 
try to track the mobile nutrients, nitrogen and sulfur, but what about the other stuff? So I, I'm not gonna wax poetically about soils like Jill and Dave have, that, that was great and very appropriate for the year of the soil, but I'm gonna just reflect on a few things that we've seen in, in our travels around the area as we've uh, looked at different research sites. And uh, I'm just gonna reflect on a few things related to nutrient availability, water availability, resistance, and porosity. So these are the, the abiotic components of soil quality that Jill referred to, tightly linked to biological activity, whether they're microbes or plants or macro uh, organisms. So I'm gonna just focus on a few things on, on related to soil formation. You know, where did the soil originally come from? How was it formed? How that's influenced soil quality, uh, rotational effects and, and tillage effects. So here's a classic textbook kind of table. Uh, first thing you have to look at is, well, what's your total soil depth? And that's related to soil productivity. So the deeper the soil, especially in our region, as I mentioned, we rely on the full root zone of uh, six feet for most annual winter crops. Uh, then you max out on, on potential productivity. And then as the, the soils get shallower, uh, you start to limit that productivity. Well, there's some really good examples that we've encountered uh, in the Pacific Northwest, whether it's the actual genesis of the soil or what we've done to the soil, but effective rooting depth. And here's a real good example out of a Soton on Mark Green's farm. And I gotta say, when we started sampling Mark's field and taking out these uh, hollow uh, metal tube cores that go down to six feet and pounding them down, and some, some fields that can be really tight soil and it's really tough to, to pound that probe in, but it, it was just cutting like butter. And the first sample we took out, you know, went, went very easily down to six feet. And I thought, man, he's got some great soil there. And then as we moved up the field, uh, every time we moved up uh, 40 feet, we'd uh, get a little bit shallower and we'd pound it down and just cut like butter and then boop, all of a sudden it was like hitting a cement, cement wall. And it was five feet and then four and three and two. <laughs> and uh, we realized that this was on a shelf uh, overlooking the, the Snake River and uh, and there was a real gradation of the soil depth uh, going down to the basalt uh, bedrock. And so that really defined the potential productivity as it varied across that field. And I think there's probably a lot of situations like that in, in the inland Pacific Northwest where you can do some precision farming uh, to account for those differences in, in water availability and, and soil productivity. Um, move, move north up to Mansfield, and we looked at a couple of fields out of uh, complements of uh, Doug Poole and, and Wade Troutman, and um, in, in converting there from uh, uh, a century of, of wheat fallow farming to try to introduce canola into the region, and uh, realizing that, boy, they've got some real soil compaction problems there um, that have accrued over the years, both, again, genetically, from the way the soils were formed, and also due to the tillage practices. So uh, this graph is a graph of soil strength uh, with depth, and, um, and so you can see that the soil strength increased fairly rapidly with depth. And uh, what we noticed then also was that uh, there were two distinct compacted layers. One uh, that was uh, explained to us as, as being uh, 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 a result of rod weeding, continuous rod weeding of the summer fallow, setting up a compacted layer below it, and then uh, the soil loosened up a little bit for, for uh, depth below that, and then it got really compact again. And that was explained to us as a, 
as a, a genetic artifact of the way the soil is formed. Back in the glacial area, the glaciers came down that far, sat on the soil, and really compressed the heck out of it. And so there were two, two separate compaction zones. And so as a result, uh, not, o not only just physical resistance as measured by a penetrometer, but you could just measure the bulk differences in bulk density. Bulk density is just the amount of soil that's compacted into a, into a certain volume. And so the lower the bulk density, the more porous it is. You have less particle mass in it. And so you can see the big increase in particle density in these two layers, uh, as reflected by the bulk density measurement. And so again, you've got your rod weeding compacted layer and your glacial compacted layer. And as a result, um, the canola tap roots that we were digging up, they exhibited this J hooking that uh, I think Frank Young re referred to that, that the tap root tries to grow down into it and it's, it's got a great reputation, the, the canola tap root, but it, it gets thwarted by a compact layer you know, it, if it has a chance to expand, it'll make a great channel for you. But, um, you know, it, it won't drill through a lot of compact layers. And so it J hooks around and then you get just a shallow root system. So that ob obviously will thwart uh, deep water and, and nutrient extraction. Okay, another uh, thing I've been thinking about with regard to subsoils is uh, the fact that we've been growing these annual crops for over a century and crops that um, will, will mine the nutrients from the subsoil, as Jill was talking about, bring them to the surface, and then we end up either harvesting off those nutrients or some of the nutrients will be stored into the wheat, wheat straw residues and returned to that surface. Well, it's kind of a one-way process that way for some of these nutrients. And I'm thinking about especially the, the nutrients that are soil immobile. They don't really leach down back into the soil very easily. Things like uh, phosphorus and boron in particular, and to a lesser extent, silica, which we don't think about too much. And so these things will tend to accumulate in the surface as uh, shown on the uh, well, let's see. Uh, so the net result then is that I think we end up getting um, deficiencies of phosphorus and boron, soil and mobile nutrients in the subsoil, and we also get an accumulation of silica, which contributes to soil crusting and more soil compaction, as uh, Taylor Beard's got a poster on that uh, showing the linkage between silica. And, and so uh, here's the difference between the distribution of soil and mobile nutrients versus mobile nutrients. And so you can see, again, uh, deficiencies occurring in the subsoil for phosphorus and boron. Now, we never used to worry too much about boron with wheat nutrition. It's more important with canola nutrition. So this is something we should really pay attention to. Uh, and, and find ways to replenish the subsoils of, of some of these immobile nutrients. As contrasted, we got mobile nutrients like nitrate and sulfate, which can leach deeper, and then we've got to have deeper rooted crops to uh, try to recover those. So again, we've got stranding of phosphorus and boron during the dry summers in the, su in the surface soil, subsoil deficiencies, and then we've got to have deeper rooted crops to recover the nitrate and sulfur. So I conclude with, uh, you know, that was a great session last night about us entering the new era of uh, unmanned aircraft and looking at your crop from 400 feet above. But just don't forget what's happening six feet below because I think that's, as everybody has said up here, that's where the action is. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Um, I'm going to start with. Uh, oops, sorry. 
has already been mentioned that uh, this year is uh, the year of soils, and I thought this uh, language from the Soil Science Society of America website uh, is pertinent to our topic today. And the first sentence says it all, and that is what uh, I would like you to, to keep in mind, that uh, soils are, finite, are a finite resource and are non-renewable on a human scale, time scale. So let's keep that in mind when we, we farm our soil. Unfortunately, uh, soil is being degraded uh, through poor management in many parts of the world. Uh, I'm going to skip this slide because people talked about it already. When I uh, talk of, when I think of soil health, uh, soil organic matter comes to, to mind. I'm uh, using soil organic carbon here because just as a proxy of soil organic matter because it is easier to measure the soil carbon than the soil organic matter. Uh, most of, of what I have on this slide have been talked about, so I'm not going to waste a lot of time on it. It is important. I think it is central to, to the soil health in all these respects in providing these ecosystem services. What I'm going to dwell more on is uh, uh, effect of our cropping systems on our soil organic matter as it relates to soil health. Uh, we are fortunate at the Pendleton Station to have uh, these long-term experiments uh, 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 starting uh, in the 1930s, and we've been looking at uh, monitoring soil organic carbon. And uh, this one, this slide you're seeing here is a wheat fallow system uh, using conventional tillage. Uh, as you can see, organic matter has been on the decrease for all the, the these follow systems, except where we are adding steer manure. And uh, this is just uh, the same uh, same uh, information, but uh, uh, taken in, in uh, 2010. We should have, okay. There's a pointer here. Taken in 2010, comparing this is the grass pasture over here comparing with all the other systems. Here is the manure treatment. As you can see, soil organic matter is decreasing all the systems. And in some cases, we have lost more than 50% of uh, organic uh, carbon compared to the, to the grassland pasture. Uh, this is not only occurring at our station, but it's also occurring on, in your fields. We sampled some fields in Sherman County and as you can see, uh, and compared that with the cemetery and the uh, native uh, uh, grasslands, the dark bar is uh, the top foot, the gray bar is the second foot. As you can see, there's more organic carbon in the, in the cemetery and uh, the native grasslands than in our, in our follow systems. The same picture uh, is observed in uh, you know, fields in Umatilla County and many other counties too. Uh, again, we have the ability to, to influence this process through our management, as these diagrams uh, 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 depict. We are in a visual cycle here. What we do today affects us in many years to come. What we do in our fields today affects uh, how much carbon we, uh, how much, how healthy our soil is, and the ecosystem services from that, uh, from that carbon, and that also relates to the yield and back again to our management. So we need to pay attention. I just want to put some numbers to, you know, this organic matter issue, because most of the farmers ask me, so what? Tell me what it means in terms of yield. And so this is what we try to do, and this is the beauty of having these long-term experiments. So instead of working on my own on these experiments, I also try to look at other experiments, other long-term experiments overseas. So we teamed up with guys from Sweden, Denmark, and Germany, and look at their long-term plots and see if we can come up with numbers, real numbers, about how organic matter affects our yields. And this is what we this is a what we came out with uh, uh, from uh, from the study. So this graph is on the on the on the y-axis you've got your yield, and then on the x-axis we have 
the uh, amount of nitrogen applied. So the dotted line is the low organic matter, the dark line is the high organic matter. So just starting with the Sweden here, you can see that the soil with, let's say, 1.2% has got a maximum yield of about, this is about 120 bushels right there. And after applying about 116 pounds per acre of nitrogen, nitrogen use efficiency there is 59 bushels of wheat per one pound of, of nitrogen. So degrade that soil by your management practices, and let's say we degrade it to 0.8% uh, organic carbon, you, you do not only lower your maximum yield to about 80, uh, lower, than, uh, lower than 80 uh, bushels an acre, but you also, you are using more nitrogen to produce that lower yield. So you are, you are decreasing your nitrogen use efficiency from 59 to 31. So we're putting more nutrients uh, for lower yield if you lose organic matter. So that's really important. Oops, sorry. And then if you look at the, the German site, pick any number, I don't know what's going on here. Pick any number, if you put 70 pounds of um, nitrogen, you can see that the soil with more carbon has got more yield for that same amount of fertilizer. Here is our pedal on site at the bottom here. And if you look at the zero line, you can see how important organic matter is in our area. I don't know this, <laughs> it looks like it's timed, yeah? <laughs> uh, so we have more, in, if you've got a soil with more than 1.4%, uh, it looks like you might not even need uh, to, to put fertilizer to get about uh, 100 uh, uh, or eight, 90 pound, uh, bushels an acre. You'd need about 90 uh, or 80 pounds per acre of nitrogen with a soil with 0.9% uh, uh, carbon to get the same yield as the other soil with 1.4% uh, uh, carbon. So there are, here are real numbers which can be used actually for carbon credits because we can uh, relate the, the, the effect of the carbon to, to, to your yield. Now moving on here, change your system to an annual cropping. In this case, this is winter wheat and spring pea rotation, and you get a different picture, even if you're tilling the soil. Just because you have intensified your cropping system, you are putting more biomass into the soil, uh, you can actually maintain carbon even if you're tilling. If, better still, if you stop tilling, you can see the, the, the increase uh, in carbon. So like what everybody's saying, Jill and everybody else, diversify, increase the, the intensity if you can. There are some areas where we cannot intensify. Lind, for example, some places in Sherman County, we cannot do that. That's where we're trying some other, other things too. So for instance, we've got all this west uh, in the forest, which is a fire hazard. And normally they just uh, pile that together and burn it. We could use that material to make biochar. Biochar is just that plant material combusted at low oxygen levels. What it does, it just carbonizes the material so it becomes uh, uh, resistant to decomposition, it can stay in the soil for hundreds of years, hundreds to thousands of years. So if you look at the bottom part of it, you can see this is uh, the biochar. If you look at it through an electron microscope, you can see the plant structure of the material remains the same. It's not like you've burnt the material. So these, these compartments here become good you know, habitats for the, for the microbes Jill was talking about, for retaining water, for retaining uh, uh, nutrients. So you could use this material and try and uh, increase our organic carbon. This material has got 80% carbon and a pH of 10. So you need to be careful when you use this material. You need to match it with your soils. This is what we did here. So after we, um, we did an experiment here, we, we, we applied 0, 10, 20, 40 tons an acre per acre of, of uh, biochar, and you can see we increased our yield 
uh, by 20 to 30, 26 to 30, 33%. Uh, at the same time, because this material had high pH, we also uh, influenced our pH, our pH uh, increased our pH from uh, 5.8 uh, to about uh, above 6. So which is a good thing, given that we've got uh, these acidic soils. And talking of acidic soils, when we did our sampling around, we found that most of our top uh, eight inches are becoming uh, below, getting below five, uh, five uh, pH. And we know what that does. If you have five pH, then the nitrogen, the phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, calcium, magnesium, they all become less available to the plants. So it is important to, um, to keep that in mind. Good morning. It's great to be here today. I get to talk about um, an organism that has already been mentioned many times and is oftentimes associated with uh, soil health concepts uh, for a few reasons that we'll talk about today. Let's see here. Can I just do this? All right. So here it is, boom, I'm sorry, this is a kind of a messy data slide. I'm not gonna do this again. Uh, this will be the only one. But I just wanted to put this up quickly to, to sh demonstrate something. And this was actually work done by a graduate student of mine, Kendall Call, who's in the audience and who has a poster so, um, out there. So if you want more information about this work, you can go talk to her. Um, but Kendall was looking at soil health indicators in two organic uh, conservation tillage systems and one conventional co conservation system. And what you can see on these graphs, here we have earthworms, um, earthworm density essentially in um, numbers per meter squared or earthworm biomass shown in the corner. Um, is that they were directly correlated, significantly correlated to many different indicators of soil quality. <laughs> so in the corner here, I'm not sure I will be able to point to it, we have microbial biomass uh, car carbon. So you can see that as earthworm number increase, we have a corresponding increase in microbial biomass carbon. Biomass carbon, uh, biomass, sorry, microbial biomass nitrogen. Uh, soil organic carbon, or SOC, as well as the total amount of nitrogen in the soil. Okay, so what this shows nicely is that earthworms, although we consider them an important driver of, of soil quality or soil health, can increase other indicators of soil health as well. Okay, so um, this work shows that nicely, and that's been demonstrated in many different studies really around the world as well. So does this really matter? Is this a big deal? So we see an increase in microbial biomass, carbon and nitrogen, and carbon and nitrogen, total nitrogen. What does it mean? Well, a few different authors have, have done what we call an, a meta-analysis, where they track down every single research paper that's been done on earthworms and cropland soils, for example. And what they've shown is that if you look across the board, when you have um, an active community of earthworms at a certain density, you can expect about a 25 to 35 percent increase in plant productivity, okay, or yield. So that's really significant. So for the rest of my talk today, I'm going to focus really on what you need to know about earthworms and some of the mechanisms by which um, these, this increase in, in plant productivity may occur. Okay, so in general we see increases in plant growth and productivity when we have high populations of earthworms, but not always, right? There is, of course, a lot of variability out there which we, we know about and have to respect. Um, and some of that comes about because earthworms aren't all the same, right? When you, uh, so we need to know what kind of earthworm species we have in a field or ecosystem. Uh, species are further grouped into three different functional groups that we talk about. The first one is epigeic, okay, and those are earthworms that really primarily live in the litter or the plant material at the surface of the soil. So they may have very few impacts directly on the soil because they spend most of their time up there at the surface. Those are generally small earthworms, not very common in our cropping systems. Anisic species are the deep dwelling earthworms that are going to burrow. Um, they're the ones that form those really nice vertical burrows straight down, and they may extend several meters um, or six feet or so more down into the soil. 
A perfect example of an anisic species would be the nightcrawler, one that we're almost all familiar with. Uh, the third group is called endogeic earthworms, and these guys tend to be a little bit smaller, um, and they also differ in their burrowing habit. The endogeics are more commonly going to um, create these branched networks of burrows, which are more horizontal than they are vertical, right? So they're going to have different impacts in terms of their um, uh, water movement and air movement within the soil. Okay? And they also tend to feed on soil organic matter more than an anisic species, which are the ones that you can see going up to the surface and pulling litter down into the burrow system. So they have different effects, perhaps, on carbon cycling as well. Okay, so we got to keep in mind who's there and what they're doing uh, when we're trying to assess the impact of earthworms on plant processes and soil properties. So what are earthworms actually doing in the soil? Uh, well, they burrow, of course. Those endogeics, especially as they're moving through the soil, they're really actively feeding on that soil organic matter. Um, and that is mixed within the earthworm gut with bacteria and fungi. So they're creating these burrows, which you can see in this picture. At the same time, all of that soil material and organic material that they ingest has to go somewhere. And it's mixed in, in the gut again and then excreted as what we call a cast. And the earthworm cast are these really nice spherical, um, tend to be fairly stable aggregates that hold up better against repeated wetting and drying events. Okay, so these are the two main mechanisms by, through which earthworms have uh, significant impacts in soils. So if you just take a look at the burrow system, and Jill showed a nice picture of a, of a very uh, distinct burrow system in soils as well. I've drawn some yellow lines here to highlight um, some simple, simplified burrow systems. Um, when we have anisic species in the system, and we're starting to see more anisic species like night crawlers moving into our direct seed soils, um, they tend to um, change the local hydrology. They increase the infiltration rate. So more water move down, moves down into the soil and enters the soil. And of course that's important because we want to get the water down into where the roots are within the soil. It's also important to think about um, in terms of erosion because whenever we can increase infiltration rate, we're going to decrease runoff and decrease erosion. Uh, we have more movement of air, exchange of gases when we have these macropores developed through the anisic species. And um, maybe more importantly, they provide a very good habitat for other organisms, especially plant roots. And this has been covered already. Um, but the importance being that these channels can provide sort of a highway, if you will, for roots to move down through the soil profile. Okay, and that's especially important when we do have compacted subsoil. So those um, roots will be able to move down through that layer and perhaps access stored water deeper in the soil profile than they would be able to if the earthworm channels weren't there. Okay, now again, we always, uh, we can't say that we're going to have increased infiltration in every single soil that we inoculate with earthworms uh, because, of course, there are these endogeic species again, right? And what we found um, in my program is that when we have a higher density of endogeic species, we don't really see the dramatic increases in the infiltration rate and movement of water. And that's probably because of their ecological habit again. So these guys are going to again perform um, burrow into the soil. They're going to make these more horizontal burrows within the, their systems. And they may or not be um, connected to the surface of the soil. Remember, the endogeics are primarily feeding on soil organic matter. So they may not go to the surface as often to get that crop residue. Another thing that we see is with certain species, they will backfill their burrows with cast material. Okay, and you can see a picture of that here, where the cast material in this burrow, which one is this? Oh, I don't know if I can even see this. It's probably out over here somewhere. I don't want to fall, knock this over. But you can see that um, here, hopefully, the earthworm has backfilled that burrow system with casts. So that's a zone of increased nutrient availability, most likely, but it's probably not going to make a nice channel for water to move through because it's effectively blocked by those casts. 
This is some work I'm excited about. Um, we have a lot of new tools. Earlier we heard about microbial ecology, tools used in mi microbial ecology. But we also have some, some uh, technology that we're applying to soils now to really study the physical properties and the impacts of soil organisms. So this is just work that was done in 2013. And you can see that they've used um, x-ray tomography here, which has been used in the medical field for, for a very long time now. Um, to look at the network of pores created by anisic and endogeic species in undisturbed columns. Okay, so we're con starting now to be able to quantify the uh, geometry and the shape and the amount of porosity formed by these organisms. And you can tell that, the, um, that these channels, for example, in this image shown here, are... Um, are not very straight, they're not uniform, and you can imagine all the surface area that's available there for exchange of nutrients and water with roots, as well as for microorganisms to colonize. And Jill mentioned the drill drillosphere, which is a zone of, of um, importance in soils. It's uh, very similar to the concept we call the rhizosphere. So this is an area, if, this were, if you were looking down inside of a pore, where we have enriched residues added to the soil, more carbon and nitrogen, as well as mucus, and sometimes casts that are actually deposited and line that burrow opening. So the drillosphere um, extends, and this is a zone of earthworm-influenced soil, about two millimeters out, although there's some work now that suggests it may be more than eight millimeters from the burrow. So not a lot of soil, but if you think about how many earthworm channels you can have per meter squared unit of ground, um, it adds up. So we know that this soil is enriched in carbon and nitrogen. It has increased microbial activity as the microbes respond to the carbon inputs. Um, and we also see increased what we call grazers. And these are the organisms that are turning over and eating that microbial biomass and releasing those nutrients, so a diverse community. We also see increased carbon and nitrogen mineralization. So we're understanding more and more about the importance of the drillosphere. And again, this is some x-ray tomography data just um, published recently. And what you can see here is that they've actually gone in and scanned this, uh, the drillosphere, here, this black spot being an earthworm burrow. And you can see the extent of it there. And we're also able, with this technology, to start mapping soil properties. So here we see bulk density distribution um, across that drillosphere soil. And again, this is very exciting work because now we can actually look at a very fine scale and get a better understanding of where roots might be, where are they going to grow, where are we going to see that transfer and movement of water and nutrients um, from the soil to the root. Okay, and finally, casts. Um, which are very important because, again, they are stable. Um, they enhance aggregate stability and decrease erosion. They can stabilize carbon by the, um, the, um, the uh, reactions that occur within the earthworm's gut that bind the organic matter and the carbon together. Um, and they provide water holding capacity in the soil. All right, so when we want to think about what's going on with our earthworms in the soil, there are various things that we need to know. We need to pay attention to who's there, not just the number, but who's there. Uh, we need to know how many are there and what their biomass is. We also need to think about how are they active, because of course in some of our soils, uh, in our rain-fed areas where we do have uh, significant dry periods, these earthworms may not be active all season long. Okay, they may go into resting states to be able to survive those dry periods. Okay, so the question is, what are the population trends in Jody's study in the REACH program? Okay, so good question. We have been monitoring earthworms in, in various growers' fields across um, the really the whole wheat-producing region of the Columbia Plateau um, for three years, and um, especially and I haven't looked at this data for a while, Russ, but <laughs> especially in the, um, the wetter areas in the annual production zone, we were noticing uh, a fairly steady for uh, two years in a row, potentially three, decrease in earthworm density that was a little uh, alarming in, in the direct seed um, systems. 
So this year we sampled, or this last year we sampled, those numbers did recover um, some. So that trend seems to have turned around. And there, there is a lot of natural variability in earthworm populations between year and year. So it's not um, that alarming to see your earthworm density go from, uh, be cut in half just due to normal variability. So we were concerned that we saw um, year after year decreases in earthworm density. So that seems to have stabilized based on the, the sampling that we did last year. So uh, thank you, Jim, for that question. The um, question is referring to the, the LTAR and what are some of the long-term uh, expectations from setting up this type of uh, a program and study. And I'll, I'll just mention, you know, I probably drank the Kool-Aid a, a while back, but, you know, from the standpoint of the success of actually being identified as a location that would house this type of effort, it really and Jim mentioned this, it was really the partnership of many people working together. And I think in the Northwest, it really reflects um, the partnership we've had over time, you know, as represented from the STEEP project uh, from the 70s to, to now with the REACH project and the SCF project, there's been a number of really collaborative efforts around the Pacific Northwest that have really uh, given us really a, a, a large competitive edge <laughs> from the standpoint of, of competing for grant dollars as well as, as being recognized as a location where partnerships happen that are really synergistic and result in really good efforts from not only researchers but also their collaborations with various stakeholders including growers, consultants, etc., agribusiness. So I, f I feel like we've we've really put it together and it's through conferences like this as well as as our history you know through the past that's really resulted in, in where we are where we are now and you know looking into the future it's just really exciting because there's a lot of technologies that can be brought to bear uh, the support that the LTR provides is kind of baseline long-term kinds of uh, support to to really target long-term studies. So we can look at fundamental changes in not only soils and the properties like we've discussed this morning, but really how different cropping systems and management uh, interact to uh, over the long term across a really diverse set of, of environments to, to keep our you know, food systems and our soils healthy. So, you know, I'm not gonna speculate too much about what that means because we're kind of moving forward with this effort now, and it's a conversation that takes place amongst you, amongst others, from the standpoint of where this goes forward with. And I'm, I had the expectation that, you know, given our history of, of partnership, that that is gonna be the key driver, and good communications, and targeting where our research priorities are and moving forward where, where they really need to be a, a long-term kind of continuous effort, I think that's you know, at least one criteria that we're looking for from the standpoint of, of this effort. Thanks. All right, let's thank our panelists and Monsanto for the sponsorship. <laughs>